All right. Well, welcome to this, uh, my first SANS webcast. Um, and we're going to be talking about training plans and IR plans, etc. Thus, the title, you came with that plan, and you're braver than I thought. You're thinking that's a Star Wars reference, as probably indicated by the graphic. There will be plenty more of those as we go through this evening. So a little bit about me before I start. Um, I've been with SANS now for many years. I originally started off, I was in the military. Did a good career there. Um, enjoyed my time in the military. Did a lot of really interesting things in very interesting places. Uh, I have other pictures of me doing proper war driving in tanks and armored vehicles, et cetera, in war zones, which is really good fun. After that, I ran a company for about uh, 16 years, during which time I actually uh, designed some incident management systems and actually got one patented in the US. Um, which was really good fun. And then after, after a while, I got sort of itchy feet and I went and worked for a, uh, an electronic arts, which is a sort of game company you may have heard of in the Bay Area, which is really good fun. I uh, got to see a lot of interesting things and work with some really good fun people. Um, but that was then. Currently, um, and as you're here now, um, I'm teaching for SANS. I've been doing so for uh, over 15 years now. Um, I've done over 100 uh, teachers of the SANS 504 Incident Handling and Hacker Techniques course. Uh, and I'm currently an author of the new LDR 553, which is a uh, incident management course, which is a little bit of a, a little bit of where this um, this whole uh, evening presentation is about. Uh, we're talking about incident management and sort of how you can practice it and how you need to practice it, why you need to practice it, et cetera. Currently, I'm at a bank, literally in a bank at the moment. Um, but if you think ah, Steve's going to be giving us lots of good secrets about the bank, no, this is drawn from my last sort of nearly 30 years in cybersecurity, seeing how people and very much my military experience has a different view as to how commercial organizations and enterprises work. So I'm going to try and sort of bring that flavor together to show you. However, uh, one of my most um, interesting aspects of my professional career was my previous job where I was at, at a company called, I'll say, Electronic Arts, where if you did a quick Google, you would have found and probably remember the breach that we had um, back in uh, 2021, which was quite uh, devastating um, in terms of, um, I would say, like a shakeup of, of what is possible in an awful lot of companies. Um, and if you do a bit of Googling on that and do a bit of research, you'll see how it was you know, token theft. It was uh, cloud-based uh, sort of attack vectors to allow them to get on the corporate. Super, super interesting uh, breach. And it's kind of, it's it's bad because it happened, but it's good that it's public. So we can kind of talk about it and sort of look over uh, what the attackers did and, and how they moved around the environment, et cetera. And as I was writing the, the LDR 553 and its predecessor, the Management 553 course, was, I was actually doing the incident commander aspects for that. Um, and that's why there's a great flavor of, practical aspects of incident management in the Leadership 553, because I see in a lot of places it's lacking. And throughout my entire career, I've seen that incident management is actually um, sadly lacking in a lot of places. Now, people may say, look, Steve, it's fine. Look, you know, we've got uh, we've got plans, et cetera. But as I'm going to highlight um, in this session, the plans aren't always good because I'll show you, I'll talk to you about how they were written, who wrote them, what their, what their goal was, et cetera. And then we'll put that to one side and we'll talk about how we can make learning about how to deal with incident response and incident management fun. We'll talk about how you can do some low tech um, artifact generation to really bring your exercises to life. And we'll talk about who you should get involved in exercises to really make them worthwhile um, and, and sort of engaging for multiple groups uh, inside your organization. Finally, we'll wrap it up by talking about a little bit about how you can sort of plan out six months to go from very small to kind of bigger and bigger, and then ultimately, potentially, full organizational uh, um, sort of exercise, which is a, a real good aspirational goal for a lot of organizations, okay? Uh, lots of memes, lots of Star Wars references. This is a, I would say, low tech. Um, we're talking about processes. We're talking about management. We're talking about uh, leadership and how to get people to work together. This is a people side of things. So you can sort of relax, chill out, have a coffee or a beer or a beverage of your choice and, and enjoy this. Now, um, a lot of times people will turn and say, well, look, Steve, it's easy. Um, we've got an incident response plan. You know, if anything happens, we're all going to open up the incident response plan and we're going to have amazingly good references and guidelines from that. And I would say possibly if you're really lucky, if you've practiced and exercised those, brilliant. But a lot of times those are simply plans that have sat on the shelf that are actually not really been exercised, haven't really been sort of you know validated for real in a real incident. 
Okay, and that's why I think it's important to look at how you develop them and, and what you do with them. Okay, now instant response plans by their very name will probably be written by the instant response team. And you can spot instant responders because they have lots of screens and they like to have lots of screens, with lots of stuff on them, hex stuff, packet traces, you know, even just command shells and things. That's how the instant responders work. And that is their world because they're very techy, they're very in the detail and they need to be accurate fast and they need to cross refer with a lot of information, typically how they work. And that's cool. You know, instant responders, they're dynamic. They're looking at what's happening in the environment. They're constantly looking to see what new stuff's come out. They're constantly trying to update their skills and stay ahead of the curve. The downside is they're also tasked with writing your plans for both them and potentially management to use. And there's where the problem starts to come in. Because if you think about the difference between, I see, and this is my personal view, if the difference between incident response and incident management is, incident response will look at the how things were popped, what the compromise was, the attack vector, who they are, how they move laterally, what data they've stolen, et cetera, which is cool, very important aspect. And they will then present this problem to the executives who will form this incident management team, getting lots of other people to see, how do we actually deal with this answer? And this is where IM differs slightly from IR. Because IR is looking at, the, say, the packet traces, the exploitation, the actual what has happened, how it's happened, how it, how it can happen again, et cetera. But that problem goes to the incident managers. And what do they look like? They tend to be these kind of people. They tend to be, you know, don't have multiple screens because they don't need them because they're not in that level of detail. They're looking at plans. They're looking at teams. They're doing that coordination. Thus, you know, the little Zoom screen in the middle is really important because that's what they do. They coordinate and they manage, they distribute information and they share it around the team. And that's a key aspect, the difference between IR and IM. Okay, I tend to see IM sitting on top of IR and IR will deal with, you know, in large organizations, will deal with 95%, maybe 99% of the problems that pop up. It's those extra, it's that 1% of things that go really bad, really big. You know, it's, uh, you know, worst case ransomware, it's major breach into the organization, it's extortion or other exfiltration of data, et cetera, that ends up on public sites. That's the kind of problem that IM has to deal with because it's not just about the what has happened, it's how do we stop it happening again? Now, some people will say, well, that's IR's job to sort that out because they can sort that because they know the, the ins and outs. But in a major incident, IR has a constant stream of things to analyze. So therefore, they lack that capacity. Thus, the execs will say, you know, to a bunch of senior execs, senior, you know, people in charge of, you know, the CTO, the CEO, et cetera, will get their heads of department and say, go form a team, support the IR team and help us fix this problem. That's the management layer. OK. And a lot of people go, oh, right. So that's different to IR. Yes. And it also needs different plans and different solutions. And therefore, if you have the techie people writing an IR plan, they will write it for them. So a lot of people go, oh, so you mean I need a whole new plan? Quite probably, okay, quite probably. Now, you could say, well, okay, let's, let's, let's go and see what guidelines are out there. I hate to tell you, they're not, it's not great pickings. The most commonly referenced document here, I've got the little excerpt here on the right-hand side, is from the, the NIST, the National Standard, Standards of Institute and Technology. And they produced this SP800-61R2. The name just rolls off the tongue. And in that, it's about 70 odd pages long. And in that, they go through the various stages of instant response. Now, those people, have, if you've done the 504, you will recognize some of these key headings, because if you've done the old PI-CIRL, the preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned, you'll recognize these headings. Cool. So the NIST standard is a sort of, you know, vendor neutral way of implementing those, that pi process. However, it's very much orientated at a protection and prevention than actually how to clean it up. To the extent that, if I actually show you, this is the complete section that covers eradication and recovery. And you can see here on the little sort of the reddish box here, containment, eradication, recovery. The next stage is post-incident activity. So on page 37 out of about 76, we have one, two, three, four paragraphs on how to do your eradication and recovery. You're like, wow. And this is effectively the IR Bible that everybody goes, oh, we reference it. We, we align to the NIST standard. Excellent. Well, there's your guidelines. 
And even in their summary, where they then actually go and say, talk about here's the sort of the headings. This is where, look, the whole containment eradication recovery comes down to recover from the incident. Look at that. Return infected systems, confirm, and you know, implement additional monitoring. That's cool. But what about the damage that's been done? What about the data that's been accessed? What about the, you know, the PII, the, the private information, the payment card in information, the health information, but more importantly, and I would refer to things like the last pass compromise stroke recompromise, what data did the attackers gain access to that will allow them back in again because they've stolen keys, they've stolen, you know, uh, they've planted uh, back doors inside your environment, etc. That is the real worry. And that is sadly not addressed by a lot of both IR plans and a lot of IM plans. And that's why the likes of LastPass, either because they didn't have a plan or because they figured it wasn't important enough or they maybe just ran out of steam, okay, they weren't able to do that full data remediation. And therefore that's why they got re-compromised because the attackers had stolen access tokens to land them back in, all right? So it's not it's not good, it's not good uh, uh, news. So also then people say to me, well, Steve, well, you're talking about IM then. So, well, how many people do I need? Well, and well, there's lots. I mean, this this is a little section from uh, from the, uh, the LDR 553 course. We look at the kind of skills that you need in a multidiscipline team to be able to deal with a major incident inside your organization. And you're just looking at it, you're like, there's a lot of people. Yeah, there is. You know, and there's anything between 26 and about 46 people you will need just directly supporting. So you can reach out to a cloud administrator. You can reach out to a desktop administrator. You can say, what are these logs? What are these events? Reset these accounts. You know, I need this system rebuilding, this system rebooting, all that kind of support. That is really intense. Now, it's great getting those people together. It's awesome if you can, if you have that capacity, you can throw them in a room and say, go sort stuff out. The next thing we'll say is, yeah, what's, where's the plans? Where's the thing that we're doing? Where's the process? And you go, well, let me go open the IR book. And the IR book is about how to deal with malware, how to, you know, to triage ransomware potentially for the first hour. Um, it's about how to, you know, deal with a website compromise or a, a lost laptop or, or maybe some unusual activity on the network. It's not for how do we deal with 500 machines compromised, you know, one of our entire data centers offline. Where's that plan? Okay, and that's part of the problem. That stuff just simply doesn't exist. So it comes down to plans. Now, plans are great, but there's two things you need to uh, You need to both have them, you know, and as Star Wars reference here, Princess Leia knew exactly what to do with them, give them to R2. Okay, once you have them, you also need to know what to do with them because having a plan and not knowing what to do with it means you basically got a book. And that's how a lot of things end up being shelfware. Because somebody writes something, somebody in maybe new to a department or somebody who's not really engaged gets called, you got to go and write the whole IR plan. And, like, uh, and they spend months doing it because there's no engagement, there's no enthusiasm, and they end up producing a book that nobody looks at, nobody reads, etc. Or it's put in a place that nobody can find it. Okay, So if you haven't got a plan, and if you haven't got people who knows what to do with the plan, and you haven't practiced it, you'll be in real trouble. Okay, real trouble. Yeah, another reference, you know, Princess Leia, a great team, the old, you know, the, the, the original proper Star Wars film, the great team that they have together, they had a plan for getting in there, but they didn't have a plan for getting out. But at least they had part of a plan, you know, and some people think you have to massively articulate every single per pops possibility and permutation. No, you don't. Good IR plans are actually really, really sort of light and structured because you want to get the right people in the right room with the right information. Give them some guidelines, you know, a little bit like like sort of bowling, uh, bowling lanes and say, there's the target. Off you go. And I always maintain that the right people with the right information will make the best decision possible for the organization. But you just got to make sure who are the right people? How do I get them in the room? Where is the room? Okay, if part of the site goes offline, how do we get a room? Because if you can't get the right people with the right information in the room, you ain't going nowhere. All right, okay. So now, lots of, lots of sort of um, rebel stuff saying here about the, how they had a great plan. The Imperials had a good plan too. Darth Vader in true sort of, you know, true planning style had a four stage plan for his entire domination, which was kill key Jedi. Reasonable film. Execute Order 66, a massive plan, enterprise-wide remediation to remove all Jedi, not really well executed. Jar Jar Binks, yeah, kind of that red herring that just pops in there, you know, some rogue operator in the middle of things, and things go wrong. 
That's because you know that whole Order 66 never really thought out. People told, go do stuff. Not planned, not well documented. How many Jedi are there? How many Jedi have we killed? What's the, what's the, you know, you need a good project manager on that. There's where the Empire fell down. Didn't have a project manager. They wanted a good list, prioritized, stacked, ranked. We got to get rid of these Jedi first, these Jedi next, younglings the next. You know, take them out, risk based approach. Didn't happen. And that's why the whole thing for the Empire fell apart. Okay. So you're thinking, okay, Steve, so. That's easy. I, I've got an IR plan. Let's play a game. Okay. So as you're sitting at home or at work, you can quietly raise your hand if, okay, and keep your hand up if you have an IR plan. No, hopefully you have. Yeah, I don't really have, an IR plan. have you got an IM plan? Like, uh, it might be amalgamated. You might hope it's part of your IR plan, but maybe you might want to check that. Okay. Have you tested it in the last six months? You're like, well, we were due to test it. We haven't quite got it. We do it once a year. Also, do it once a year. Do you have any execs on the test? Do you actually get the execs involved in the IM? I am an IR planning because getting them involved is amazingly good. It's a real level set as to what's going on. Have you found less than five things to improve? Because every time I run an exercise, we have a massive list. Oh, we could do this. We could do this. We could make that dashboard. We need to speak to this team. That means you've had a good exercise because you've found problems. If you all sit about and go like, yeah, yeah, that was all good. Yeah. That means that it was a, like a once a year, you didn't have any problems because nobody wants to say, I think we should fix this because nobody wants to own the problem. All right. And that means you end up with shelfware that everybody hopes, please don't have a major incident because that, that plan ain't going to survive, but I don't want the poison chalice that is fixing it. Did you find nothing that you can prove? I've been really impressed, but only if you've done regular, really regular exercises would you have nothing to improve. Have you tested more than 20 times? If you do it once a year, that's not enough. Even once a month, it's like, eh, I could do it once a month. More than once a month would be better. Okay, all cool. So your quick takeaway midway through the talk. Takeaway from here is make sure you have, a, have an IR plan. Have an IM plan. If it's part of the same one, that's cool, but at least check. Get hands-on plan and have a look at it and see what you're going to be following at three o'clock on a Saturday night, okay? Because that's when these things happen. Exercise those plans. Actually get them through and run through them to see, do they stand up in the, in the office at three o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon? Do they stand up at two o'clock on a Saturday night when you're trying to work your way through them to work out who to call and how to contact them? and develop the teams because actually really developing the teams is about doing the exercises. It's about connecting people and seeing what works and what doesn't. Because if you don't connect the teams, if you don't connect the people, then you end up with this massive problem that kicks off say two o'clock Saturday night uh, or Saturday, Saturday morning um, type thing, Friday night, Saturday morning, it kicks off really early and you end up with SOC operators having to deal with the problem. Because that's the first people that are going to actually pick up the IR plan and run with the processes, your SOC, all right? So then you think about what has the SOC got? Well, if you ask the SOC, if you have a major incident, what's the thing that's going to scare you the most? And a lot of them will be like, yeah, talking to the execs. You're like, well, talking to the execs is easy. If, you know, me talking to the execs, I'm, I'm, I've been doing it for like, I've been doing it so long now, I'm quite comfortable with it. But a lot of SOC operators, they're like, you know, first year out of uh, or second year graduates from university. They're new to the organization. They, they're they a little bit cautious. They're not super confident. And somebody says, yeah, can you just go and, and, and like wake up your boss's 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 boss at three o'clock in the morning and ask them something about this incident? They're like, no, no, no. They need to be really confident and really really strong in themselves to be able to do that. Now, some of them are. Some of them, you get a really good SOC operator there. You get some of the crusty ones there. I've been here seven years. I'll call them any time in the morning. Yeah, get them up there. Boss, got a problem for you. That's cool. But some of the other ones are a little bit nervous. And time is important when you're dealing with incidents. Now, why is this problem? Because the, the, the SOC's got this like weird, similar, uh, I got this C2 beacon to a ransomware domain. That might mean we might have ransomware. <laughs> but it might be a false positive. Do I wake the boss up? Okay. And this is the problem. They're very scared. Now, this could be because they've never met the boss. 
They've seen him on. They've seen him on like maybe um, internal webcasts and podcasts and things. They've seen you know seen his name everywhere. Seen him on LinkedIn. Maybe seen him on television and stuff. They're like, yeah, but that's the boss. I don't know him. I've never met him. He's like a scary, intimidating figure. He could get me sacked. Like boom. I say, you know, we need to do something. He'll say, well, what's the answer? And you'll go, I don't know. He say, you're fired. Like, they'll be scared. So that's a problem. They don't know how to talk to the boss. Because the boss talks, manage, they talk about risks and impacts. And I'm looking at a thing going, malware, um, beacons, the language doesn't meet. So I'm not sure what they're saying. So I don't understand the question. He's saying, uh, what's the business unit that's been most impacted by this, this activity? You're like, uh, wee, wah, 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 wah. Uh, here's the host name. Is that any good? And the boss is like, I don't need a host name. Tell me the business unit. Uh, uh, they don't understand the question. Or they don't know what the answer looks like. Uh, I mean, you I mean like it's it, Joe? Joe? Joe is the, Joe is the business unit. He's the he's the guy. Who, it, it, Joe's not the answer. Joe's not the answer. They don't know what the answer looks like. Okay, and and knowing the kind of questions that the execs can ask, and knowing the kind of answers that they're expecting to have, is an amazing thing that you get. You know where it's coming from? From running a practice, from running an exercise. Okay, because. Also, it's worse is if I don't know what they're asking for and I don't know what the answer looks like, but actually I don't know anything because all we've had is this beacon and I'm really unsure, but the plan said inform the boss straight away. I'm telling you, we've got a beacon to a ransomware C2 domain. I've done my bit because this, this is all the playbook says. Playbook says, boom, tell the boss. Boss, what do you want me to do? And he's like, I don't know. What's the plan say next? And it says, ask you. Oh. And then you end up this problem. I says, well, get your boss on the phone. So we end up getting more people until, until we get those other people online and start thinking about the problem is we don't move forward, okay? So if you haven't got any plans, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're saying, you don't know what the questions are asking, it's a real problem. And that's, you're only gonna get over that by getting the people to talk and work together. Now I keep using the word exercise um, because I'm ex-military. Okay, now here's the weird thing. People think um, we're gonna run a, we're gonna run a, um, an enterprise-wide IR test. They use the word test. I don't really use the word test. Exercise is much better because people like exercise. People go to the gym all the time. When people go to the gym, they love doing exercises. The military go on exercises. They go on military maneuvers to exercise their capability, to practice what they're doing. So in the military, it's a positive term. In the gym, it's a positive term. But for some reason, we use a negative term of a test. We're going to test the IR plan, test the response. Every year we test it. Why do we test it? Compliance. For compliance purposes, we're going to test the plan and actually do this. And that's how we're going to do this. Well, that's difficult. And that's, that's setting the wrong mindset. Because what you want is, I want an encouraging, I want an engaging place that we can actually break down barriers. Because we've got an IR team that's trying to talk to an IM and an execs, and we have problems. You know, because like I said, the IR team are all techie. Um, they're trying to explain things. The execs are trying to parse and process things when it's three o'clock in the morning, and they're like, well, what's a beacon? What do you mean a beacon? What's beacon? What's, what's beacon mean? What, what, what is this? And then you end up having to explain it and explain it and explain it until finally they go like, oh, we got ransomware in the network. Yes. All right, then. Now I know what's going on. That's cool, but that time is lost. So understanding how to talk to people and how to communicate is an important thing that you only get through practice. Because think of the IR playbook and the IM playbook as a recipe guide. Now, if you cook regularly, you'll be like, oh, I, I don't need a, I don't need a, a recipe guide. I, I can make this from scratch. Awesome. Musicians can make music from scratch. They don't need manuscripts. A musician, the manuscript is the IR plan. For a chef, the recipe book is the IR plan. Some of you can cook. Some of you cannot. Some of you say, I've never been taught to cook. Therefore, I cannot cook. You give me the recipe book and I will, I will make it uh, just about, but it may not be edible. Why should your IR plan be any different? Just because you have the steps, if you've never followed them in a sort of a, a high pressure environment, you will never actually know can you make that cake under pressure? You know, somebody's got a gun to your head. Can you make a cake? Yeah. Okay, so there's a problem. So ultimate thing is you got to exercise. Exercise is the way of breaking down those barriers. Okay, kind of things that I found uh, when I've been doing um, exercises. It's really good stuff. We had people like had amazingly long ransomware plans, like literally like, you know, 40, 50 page long ransomware plans. I'm like, who's going to read that? 
You know, when you sit there and go, oh, we've got ransomware. Hang on, page one. You know, that's not going to be readable. You need things to be operationally distilled down to be ready. Uh, one organization had uh, they'd moved to, to uh, Google Cloud, but they still had all their forensics talking about, you know, um, uh, AWS, et cetera, which is kind of kind of bad. You've missed the updates. Um, only had forensics that you could use via VPN. Okay, no, no external cloud-based access. You're like, ooh, that's a bit difficult. So if I think there's malware, I'm going to disconnect the VPN. Oh, well, that means I can't do the forensics. Now I don't know what's happened. Or worse still, I remember one organization who they said, oh, um, your laptop has just beaconed to a ransomware domain. We need to check your laptop. Please connect it to the VPN so we can run our tools against it. <laughs> and th this is what the engineers were doing. And the rest of the team are like, no. <laughs> because they're like, well, that's the process, isn't it? If I want to scan the machine, I connect it to the network. But that's, that's not documented. That's not in the plans. So really bad stuff. So that kind of stuff, we have had uh, tools linked to single sign-on, which is cool. Single sign-on, amazingly good. But where's the disaster recovery accounts? Because if your domain controller is encrypted, your single sign-on just failed. And now you can't even log into the tools or the VPN to get access to the tools to do the analysis to work out what's happened. You can see where things go like, oh, yeah. But it was all fine when you're all sat in the office at 3 o'clock on a Wednesday, but at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning... That VPN's offline, that domain controller's offline, you've got no exchange, no contacts, no SharePoint for your plan, and you're locked out of your tools. That's a hard lesson to learn, really hard, okay? And the final one, really important one there, is no emergency fallback call, you know, sort of like call processes. You know, like I said, people go, oh, we're a Microsoft shop, we're using Teams, and Teams doesn't go down, doesn't it? Microsoft have had several problems with Teams over at least in 2023. And also we've had problems with the availability of it where people couldn't log on, people couldn't access it. So you go, okay, so this is maybe a small chance. What's the likelihood that it's offline when we need it? Where's the plan for it? So people go, it's okay, we'll, um, we'll, we've got this telephone number thing, we'll phone into it and everything else. Do you remember telephone only voice? like conferencing when you're just get going and somebody like joins okay then uh yeah i've just joined what's going on and then two seconds later boop uh just join what's going on and then somebody goes oh um yeah i dropped can you just like tell me what's happening and you know for the sock operator they're hearing all these execs voices they have no idea who's who and they're getting direction for people like, is that is that the boss is that, is that the ceo is that is that the ir lead is is that i don't know they don't know. So it's very confusing. So having some visual form of being able to communicate is cool because then, you know, there has been many a time when attackers have joined into, you know, disaster recovery communications and monitored the blue team trying to kick the attacker out. That is common. So having the ability to be able to see who's on the call, vet who's on the call, and also share data, you know, saying, oh, look, we found the malware hash. Yeah. Do you want to read out the hash to me? Do you want to not? So what is your fallback plan? I don't care if it's WhatsApp, Signal. If you're Microsoft, you use Google. If you Google, you use Microsoft. I don't care what it is, but make sure you have it. You have it documented and you have legal approving it before you start sharing sensitive information on an unapproved cloud. Right? These are things that you find when you go to reach for something and it's not there. Looked good on paper, but physically not there. I talk about exercises. Who plays? I love to have lots of people on my exercise. You know, more people I get in better. Okay, so we'll do, let's start normal, small. So you might think, oh yeah, we've done an exercise. We've done, we, we did the last exercise four months ago. We had the IR team involved. Yeah, cool. Incident management. Yeah, we had a few of those. Sock, well, we have that sock in there because they raised the ticket, but keeping them in, in the loop involved is kind of important. Network engineering. Oh yeah, we'll have net engine there. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Active directory admins, of course. So backup admins, maybe. Those are good people, you know, in the middle of a ransomware. One of the first things you want to do is say, hey, get those backups offline if they're not offline already. Um, and let's see if we can maybe start recalling backups because we're going to start rebuilding stuff really quickly. That kind of stuff. Desktop admins, you know, good because you might have some separate admins. might even be outsourced. How do you contact that outsourced organization? Cloud admins because we've got AWS. Oh, but we've also got GCP. Oh, and we've also got, you know, Azure. So we need three different cloud admins. You're like, oh, wow, because they've all got different relationships with the organization and will have different responsibilities and different access. So you can get all of them involved, okay? The execs, always good to have on exercise, always good. If you can get them in, get some of the C-levels in. You know, maybe you maybe only get them in once a year, but certainly lots of people could be involved in these incidents. Now you may be thinking, Steve, this is a big list. 
You don't do them all at once. You keep a nice small cluster and you bring some people in say, you're going to help us play for a couple of exercises and then we will ask you to retire and we'll bring a new team in. So you're working with lots of different groups throughout the year, building up your experience, your exposure and your working processes with those people. And that's the real value of running an exercise. Who else I got in there? HR. You think, why do I need HR? Are they internal? Do I need to have people working extra long hours? Can I do that? Can I get them to work extra long hours? Do I need to sack people? All of these kind of things. Press. Well, you may think, oh, well, you know, press team. Well, those are, those are, we don't need to exercise those. The press people know what they're doing. Press people know what they're doing to say, hey, look, we had an amazing last quarter. Oh, look at our latest product. Look at these neat, great new features. Ask your press people, your corporate comms people, have you ever had to write a bad notification about how we're under attack? How would you do that? What's your release process? Who approves it? How do you get it ver uh, sort of localized into all the different languages that you deal in? How long does that take? How do you do it in the afternoon? How do you do it at 2 a.m.? You're like, oh, that's something to practice. What is the emergency fallback process? Do you know somebody who can speak fluent English and you know, fluent German and Spanish? Okay, that'd be amazing if you could get those people, but you may not. You may have to get multiple people. You may think, well, why do I need to do this? Because... If you can't speak to people, if you can't notify customers in their appropriate language at an appropriate time frame for when the compromise happened, you may be in breach of some regulation that your organization is held to. So it's important to think about these. Investor relations, you're like, oh, seriously, you're going to talk about that? Well, the whole, you know, we've got the uh, you know European legislation coming out. We've just got the SEC legislation coming out, which is coming into effect later in the year. These things, you know, if it's going to affect the affect the investor, we need to think about the messaging that goes to that and goes to those people. How do we put that out? How do we need to phrase it? What time frame have we got to be able to notify investors, regulators, and things like this? All important stuff. And then finally, try getting some business units involved. Because we end up doing a lot of it in the infrastructure. But actually, we don't go, hey, you're a business unit. Can we, do you want to come and play with us? Would you like to come and have an exercise? Let's say you know, I'm in banking. So I might say, hey, your retail. Do you want your retail banking people? Get you in there. Can the markets people. Do you want to get some of the markets people? Do you want to get some of them to play? You know, things like that. And you, a lot of times, you, a lot of times you get people like, yeah, I'd like to see what, what that is. I've done some really nice exercises with some developers. And they go, one team of developers, one, shortly after I joined here, actually, they went like, we want to see how bad it can get. You know, can't be, bro. Just have some fun. And we did. And we showed them how bad it could be. We gave them some really good hypothetical situations backed up with some nice artifacts. And they're like, wow. It was really engaging for them because they'd, they'd seen things and they've seen films and stuff. But this was stuff about them, really good exercises that they thoroughly enjoyed. So that's cool. That's, I mean, people go, that's a really good list of people. There's more. Let's strip it back. So I take my core element. Okay, it's a really bad incident. Have you got retained IR? You ever got them involved? You ever spoken? Are they any good? Who are they? I, I, was, I was talking with one organization and they actually were an IR company. So they said, they're like, hang on, they're an IR company. And we're also a product company. So they're a security product company and IR company. They said, but hang on, if we invoke our insurance because we get hacked, they're going to bring a different company, also known as a competitor, into our network to deploy their agent to look at our stuff, to take our intelligence away. Are we going to pay for this? Oh, they had to massively. It was only when we were going through this kind of discussion, I was going through this kind of presentation. They were like, we need to rethink actually how we do this because there's this like massive intellectual property things. We need to think about where we deploy them, how we deploy them, can we deploy them? Because they're a competitor seeing our, you know, our crown jewels. So that's bad. If you, so you got your retained IR, you also got your insurance. If you invoke the insurance, they're going to bring their own team in. How are they? Are they any good? You're like, oh, same problem. You're like, oh, wow. So retained IR, insurance IR. How about your retained disaster recovery press company? You're like, we have one of those. If you don't, maybe you want one. You know, um, if you are a large organization, you may have, I don't know, say you got you're, you've got a lot of customers. You're a product-based company. You've got, I don't know, even a million users, okay? A million users, you get breached. How many of those things, how many of those users are going to want to contact you on the website, which is currently offline? Email, which you're not getting. So what's left? It's going to be things like call centers. So you've got exit. We'll invoke the disaster recovery press company. So they're going to put out press releases. They're going to manage the calls, et cetera. They're going to do all that aspect. Where do they get the script from? Who approves the script? What's the flow of that? Oh, 
These are things that you don't want to be finding out at 2 a.m. on Saturday morning. That's something you should exercise and plan and tabletop beforehand. Say, look, we'd love to talk to you. How does this work? What's the release mechanism? Who are the best people? How do we call you in? These are all things that you find out in exercise. And you're legal. Where's your outside counsel? Are you going to give them super sensitive information? Do you need to maybe vet who they are, what they're doing, what access they have? Where are, which inter, which, which, are they in your country? Are they in different jurisdiction? Uh, is, is your data that you're going to send them to get their advice going to cross international boundaries? Is there some other you know, regulations that you may be breaching by how you send them the data? Okay, important things to ask. So as you can guess, I'm very much a practical type thing. Um, I love this quote by from uh, 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 Colonel Patton there saying, you know, fight like you train. So literally doing the exercises for as real as you can make them. And that's what I really try and push towards. And I like to have them really dynamic. I like to have them fun. I like to have them interesting. And that's that's how I run them. That's, that's how I do really fun, interesting exercises. So let's have a look at some really simple ideas. Supply chain. I'm going to give you an example of a supply chain attack that I did last week with my team. Okay, and it was super simple to do. It didn't take long to set up, literally minutes. But I'll show you how I set it up, actually. Um, but it was a really interesting process to go through because a lot of times you don't even need actual technical artifacts. Technical artifacts are good if you want to see how long things take and add an element of time realism. But to be honest, a lot of times with tabletops, you just need to go there. How would we do this? And people go, oh, we would do that. And you go, show me. Show me what that would look like. How would you? People go, oh, we would talk to these admins. Which admins? Oh, the, 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 um, the server admins for there. Okay, well, give me a name. I I don't know a name. Have we spoken to them before? I you know. Should we speak to them? Maybe yes. That's a finding. We need to speak to that team. How do we how do we engage with them? If you're going to start exchanging information with people like um, admins, etc., it's about what format do you want information. I'm going to give you a list of my ransomware example. I got actually I don't think ransomware is next. Ransomware example. I give you 500 machines that have been ransomware or uh, encrypted, locked down inside my environment. 500 machines. I know host names. What does the boss want? Business units. How do I convert host names to business units? I go to the admin and say, hey, I'm going to list of 500 um, uh, machines here. Can you can, like, tell me like which business unit they're from? Like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Give it to me. You give him the file over. He's like, ah, can you change the format of the file? Because I can't, I can't, I can't. No, a CSV would be nice, but uh, no, I can't, I can't do this. This. Uh, can you, can you chop it down this way and slice it that way? Like, okay, cool. Knowing that, means I can then go, okay, I need to pull the output from my tool in a nice way that I can give it to them without any manipulation. And that increases speed, that increases your reaction time. Because I can just go, boom, you know, export from my from my uh, uh, my SIM to say, here's all the hosts that have got the particular flag on them that is the readme file from the attackers. I get that, boom, here's my list, export it directly, drop it into team, Slack, whatever, to the team and go, boom, I need business units, I need them quickly, and I need them in this format because I'm going to give them to the execs. OK, and I want them in a format that says, you know, host name, owner, business unit. And they're going to produce me a CSV like that because I'm going to drop it into Excel and I'm going to make the most important thing that you can make for an exec, a pie chart. I'm going to make a pie chart that shows here is the business units that have been impacted. That's all I need to do. So when the boss says, you got ransomware, you go, yep, 500 machines. Boom, there's your pie chart. He's like, oh, awesome. I can, the boss can then take that and go, I can now go and work with the board and the SLT, et cetera, the senior leadership team to work out what we can do based upon the criticality of those business units, okay? Because at our level, at the SOC and IM level, we're going to be like working at one level, but they're going to be looking at the higher things. What is our business functions? What business functions are going to be impacted and how are we going to prioritize that stuff? That is classic information that they want to have and we give it to them in a digestible format. And it's so good. Another good one, social engineering. I hear a little birdie, VX Underground, tells me that social engineering got MGM Studios encrypted. I don't know. I just read it in a tweet. Uh, I still call them tweets. Um, but there's there's another one, a classic. Oh, it would never happen to us. You're like, oh, look at that. It just maybe happened to MGM. Oh, is it M MGM Studio? The casino in Vegas. MGM. They got social engineered and now ransomware. So you're like, wow. So that's possible. And remember, I love ransomware as the typical example. The ransomware doesn't need to get huge amounts of data to destroy your customer trust. 
If they can get access to a single laptop and get just 50 gigabytes of data from an engineer that's designed diagrams and stuff like that, they can say, we were in your engineering aspects. We've got 50 gigabytes of sensitive data. That's enough. If you're like me in a regulated place, you're in, you know, you're in regulatory hell now because the regulator's going to go, oh, you got ransomware, blah, 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 all these forms and those forms and everything else. So it doesn't need to be big to be impactful. All right. And that's the thing. That, so people think, oh, yo, how am I going to deal with this? You don't have to go large. Uh, social engineering, ransomware, and a couple of laptops. How would you deal with it? So it's not the major 500, 5,000 machines. It's five. Ooh, what do we do? Then you get the whole sort of ransomware negotiations and all those kind of things. Really interesting table talks. You look at internal file shares, you know, a little internal SMB worm running around the network. That would be good, quite nice. Speak to some uh, speak to some of your developers, your admins, and they'll write you one that's quite quick. A little bit of PowerShell that just copies itself to various SMB directories. Super easy. Okay. Movie star vulnerability. <laughs> I mean, we haven't had enough of those, the log4j's and all the various other things that have popped up. So run one of those. You have a vulnerability. It's on the boundary. It's like I have 40 gate firewalls because they've had enough problems. Um, so it's a 40 gate firewall. It's on your boundary. How would you deal with it? People are like, oh, that's not an incident. Why isn't it? Because, oh, well, we need to go and validate first. So that's the identification. And then if it is bad, it's the containment. And are you not now following the PySerl, the NIST process? So really your incident team is the best team to get there because actually if you do find it's a problem, you're already, you're briefed and you're ready to go. So really running major rock star vulnerabilities, these ones that got their own logo and stuff, those kind of ones or zero day ones, those are actually really useful to have a good IAM plan together. And maybe even writing a dedicated one just for rockstar vulnerabilities. Who's going to be coming in from the vulnerability team, from the intelligence team, from the admins, the execs, firewalls, networks. Boom, there's a whole little plan that you can run through about validation, testing, um, and what to do for forensics if you need to after that. Brilliant stuff, really easy to set up. You can do that on tabletop in like an afternoon. Grab a couple of pizzas, a really good chilled afternoon. Fun thing. You know, lots of whiteboards, lots of drawing, good, interesting stuff. And people say to me, you don't run an exercise assembly. I'm like, I do actually. I just love dropping really simple exercises. And because if you do them regularly enough, um, and at one point I've done the, we, 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 did, we were doing the weekly. I mean, literally people are like, oh, we want it every six months. I'm like, no, do weekly. If you want to learn something, do weekly. You get a cadence. Now I'm down to like two weekly. Okay. People are like, two weekly exercises. Yeah, we're not. Because it's not a, oh my goodness, it's a big test. It's like, it's an exercise to see what we need to learn. All right, see how we can improve things. And I say, yes, you can actually run a simple exercise. This is the one I ran last week, okay? This is from my website, Danzig Mang's website. This is a real story to say, uh, we have, you know, we've got a strategic partnership now with Infosys. Um, and as of the 1st of September, our colleagues that used to be at Danzga IT have now moved to Infosys. You're like, cool. There's what I went with. Now I went with that last week. And just to give you a bit of context, let me just check my calendar as to when last week was, because I've slept since then, that old adage. Um, last week, I gave them that. We were doing that on the, on the 8th. And you think, oh, 8th of September. So seven days after the transfer, it's a third party. Or is it? Was the compromise when they were part of you? But it doesn't make any difference because they still have data. So... How do we deal with that? What's the roots? And we started going through those processes. How would we talk to people? Who would we reach out with? And we went through to sort of say, right, how can we improve our ability to communicate with our now partners who are an external organization? Because some of the communication methods we have are no longer valid. So, you know, we can say, well, can we still use, can we still use our internal communications? We have to go through external. We have to go through legal now to release information to what used to be internal. These are, you know, like, oh, that's not important. It's maybe not, you may not think it's important, but if you're regulated, then you may have a, in the heat of the moment, we did this. And six months later, you're paying for it, being buried in audit forms. All right. So making sure that you're fully compliant. Okay. And this is simple. I, this, I just, this literally took me seconds to put together. Here's the website. Boom. Here's the news article. Off you go. Okay. And, you know, there's, there's how I put that together. Literally break your own news.com. And you go, hey, like, is that important? It makes people, if you go into it and say, let's do a little bit of role play, a little bit of fun, a little bit of chill, and you put that up, people are like, ooh, ooh. And it does get the old ticker. I mean, I've got, when we first started doing the exercises, one of the uh, one of the teams sent me their, um, sent me their um, uh, watch data. And you can see where the heart rate went, whoop, because <laughs> they were the incident commander. Because how I do it, you turn up for the game, you turn up and we literally screenshot everybody's head. You get a number placed on your head. We roll a dice, and that person's the incident commander. 
because that's the way it works. It's not like, oh yeah, we'll do Joe because Joe's knows what he's doing. If Joe knows what he's doing, he's the last person we want to practice. We want to practice the new person. So it's totally luck. And they get to you know do that. We do it. Either they pick a deputy or we roll a dice for the deputy. Boom, there's the team. And then we give them the problem. And that's it. And that's how we do it. And it's 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 not stressful. It's like, you know, there's an element of stress, professional stress. You're like, oh my goodness, I gotta do well. But that's it. So we make it fun, we make it a laugh. And then afterwards, we do a bit of a, a, a wash up afterwards. Say, how did that go? We ask the instant commander, how did that go? And they're like, oh, we could do this better, that better, that better. We can make a dashboard for this. We could look a search for this and things like that. We're like, that's awesome. Back to our ransomware one. Example, if you think if the, the attacker spreads the ransomware by a GPO, we could look to see what GPOs have been changed in the last like two weeks. Oh, that would be really cool. Can we get access to that? Yes, we can get access to that tool. Excellent. So by doing the ransomware exercise and learning about that, finding out they have a tool to show that, we add, add that into our routine. So now we get a ransomware beacon. The person's trying to work out the host and he looks to see how is it spreading. Goes in to check the tool that says how many GPOs have changed in the last two weeks on one of those changes. And they can look and go, it's not spreading by GPO. So that's one thing we know. So that might narrow down knowing who the attacker is. And that's easy things that we found out. Exfiltration. Exfiltration is a really hard thing to detect in any organization. So you may have squelched all those rules, but if you've just been ransomware, you might go, how much stuff did we exfiltrate in the last, like, I don't know, 20 days? So who are the big uploaders? That's a separate dashboard you never look at until you need to when you've been ransomware. Again, that's preparation stuff that you find. It's really cool. All right. Now, I say I did. Um, I did this um, exercise I mentioned earlier. I did this for one of the development teams. This and this is really funny, actually. Um, we did this for them, and it was a. Uh, it was on one week, and at that weekend, two organizations were hacked. Uber was hacked, and, and Rockstar Games were hacked, and they were both hacked with the attacker going, "Nah, nah, I got your data." And that was how they learned about it. They had to go, "Oh my goodness, what is the data? Where was it? And everything else." That was how their real incidents happened. So I did a similar one, okay? I took a basic page. This was uh, breached uh, forums that was there. And I modified it to put a little bit of data on there, okay? And I've redacted all the bits and pieces, but I put a little down the bottom there, put a snapshot photograph of database tables from our environment. Like, oh, so made it real. So I flashed up and said, ah, news breaking, you know, exercise, exercise, we've been hacked. I'm like, ah, yeah, here's the forum post. Notice how I've changed a bit at the top there. Look, Dan's my threat. This is all exercise data. That's what they think here. This is not real. And I show them, and they're like, ah, oh, look, there's the data. And they're like, that's ours. And the emotional response was there. And as a trainer, when you get an emotional response from somebody, you're like, you're, they're living it. And for the next four hours, they lived it hard because we took them through a little horrible thing as to how bad it could be. Simulated, okay? Showing them various artifacts, bringing them real stuff out of it. All really easy to produce, okay? Using a little bit of red team resources, a couple of screenshots, a couple of things from internally, made it real for them. And like, oh, this is really hard. And that's the lesson that they learned. And they loved it. Absolutely loved it. Made them a security evangelist at this point. Um, this is what I broke it with. And okay, not a real story again, as you can see, break your own news, super simple stuff. But when, you know, when you're a developer, go, we're doing the security exercise. And then you see this, you're like, oh. you know, the stuff's got real. And that's what I want. All right. Really good fun. So people say, well, what do you expect them to learn? Lots of things can be learned from exercises. How long do things take? You know, are you trying to do forensics and PCI? How long does that take? Oh, it takes about an hour. <laughs> Three days later, mm, it's really hard to do forensics and PCI. Yeah, do you get your tool in? No, 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 it's not PCI approved. Okay, cool, do you get the data out? No, 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 that's PCI data. Well, something's got to give. And you go, oh, but it looked really good on the plan. You know, do forensics. So how long does that take? Having realistic expectations mean when the boss says, what are you doing? We're going, we're doing forensics. Excellent, when's the result? Four days. Four days to do forensics? That's how long it took on the exercise. Oh man, can I fix that? Possibly, but I'm setting your expectations so that you can come up with the same barriers that we did. Really cool stuff. Um, I mentioned earlier about the you know isolating networks. Say so, you know we change the networks, you change the environment. You suddenly say, oh, we've got a, we've got an incident. Let's cut off all the um, all of the uh, the VPN uh, people. Great, do that as a scenario. Okay, set that up. It's a really good fun one to do. Set that up as a scenario, have people you know, remoting in, et cetera, and then go, oh no, we got ransomware. Cut the VPN. Excellent. All you people who are remote, you're now off. You're now, you can watch, but you cannot get involved. And they're like, oh, what's your disaster recovery for that? They're like, oh, we didn't think about that. Cool things.
and you find out gaps. You find out processes, templates, guides, authorization processes. When the execs are going, I need, okay, we need to isolate part of the network. Which parts of the network can we isolate? If you can say, you can cut this bit here, no damage. This bit here, no damage. This bit here, that's going to hurt us. This bit here, hurt customers. Okay, now they say, where's the business unit affected? Over here. Brilliant. Cut it. And you learn all that because you have the difficult questions from the execs. The sous chef has come around. The master chef has come around, dipped his finger and went, okay, I like what you're doing because you've practiced. And unless you practice, you ain't going to improve. Here's how we do my simple sort of hot seats. You run hot seat, but it takes about an hour. I do, I do it Friday afternoons. Okay, at the moment we're doing it Friday mornings because I can't get a slot, but uh, that's after summer stuff. But get it back into Friday afternoon. People are chilled. They're like, it's, people go, hey, it's a Friday afternoon. We're going to do wind down. It's not too much pressure. They're in a good mood. That's the kind of atmosphere you want. Set it for about 30 minutes. You, then you do a debrief. You have the instant commander, the deputy does the debrief, et cetera. And then sort of whoever organized it. Then you do like, a, what, what gaps have we got? What can we fill? Who can do it? Document it. Boom, get it fixed. Okay, that's how you, and then next time you learn. It's simple stuff. It's cool. If I'm doing, um, if I want to do sort of a, a deep dive into what kind of exercises I would do, I mean, let me just give my little pointer up here. Um, I'll do a little bit of pen. Um, I could do, do I want to do tech-based or non-tech? non tech super easy, like the ones I showed you. Okay, simple, simple, easy to do, to make up those graphics, et cetera. If I want to do tech-based ones, I can do them quite easily too. Here's a simple example that I've used like numerous times. You spin up a, a quick um, WordPress website, costs you zero dollars. You put a document on there, a pay, like anything, okay? Any sort of picture on there, that's your C2, all right? You send an email from a Hotmail account that you've just made. You send it into yourself and four or five other people with simply, you know, either a link or something else. You're going to have to modify it to make sure you get past your own phishing type stuff because symbol link, like, please click me. But a little bit of a story. Hey, look, we're running an exercise. I'd really like you if you could help us out here. I, I've usually pre-spoken to these people. Help us out, a couple of graphics. Um, here's a link. I'd like you to click this between this time and this time because uh, it's going to generate some artifacts. You do that with people you've arranged. You give them a code word so they know that they're not being phished. All right, And all they simply do is open up the email, click the thing, boom, they go to that point. What have we got now? We've now got machines have received emails and made connections to IP addresses that you know. So then you can turn around and say, give it a couple of hours maybe and say, okay, the intelligence for the exercise is that uh, you know law enforcement has advised us that this IP address is particularly malicious um, and they believe that some of your machines are talking to that IP address. We need to know what machines, what there are, what business unit, and how did they get compromised? Off you go. And there you go. And that's a really simple one, but there's now artifacts. They've got to go to the SIM. They've got to look at who's been talking to that, the firewall logs, and then work out, okay, these machines were affected. How did they get affected? Was it what programs are running? Uh, what's, the, what's the process chain? What's the email? What's the sender? Who else got those emails? That's a simple, that's a half an hour, but it's a nice run through. Okay. And then you can expand that out as simply as you want. So that's cool. We do tech ones, non-tech ones. We see who wants to train. We work out the data that we want to do. And boom, we throw it together. You can literally do it in about five, 10 minutes. I mean, my, my team will tell you, I literally did it in five minutes. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do the exercise. You know, like that one I showed you from last week, the supply chain one. That was a really useful exercise. Everybody were like, we'll run this as just like a, let's see what, what you know, let's see what the problems are. So therefore people are like, this is a learning activity. It becomes engaging. It becomes open. It becomes positive, And that's what people want. Okay. If you're going to do this, sort of try and build it up, I would say do a little bit of IR stuff. People also do, we're going to do a big exercise. Everybody's involved. And then they're so stressed because they think it's going to fall apart. They're like, ah. So start off small. Just a little bit of IR, a little bit of tabletop, a little bit of technical, incident management, a bit of briefing, a bit of coordination. Um, I haven't got on this one, but when I do my Friday afternoons ones, my CISO, my CSO, had a standing invite. So like anytime you're free, you want to just join in and be the CISO? And my team knew that. They knew at any point during the exercise, the boss could just pop in and go, ha ha, I'm the CSO, brief me, brief me now. So they had to be ready at any point because that's the way life works. So knowing that there is that, that the professional quality that needs to be there, it is still relaxed, it is still fun. We're going through the briefings, but it's a learning activity. It's super fun. And for a Friday afternoon, what better can you get? Once you've done a bit of IM, get legal in. Say, like, what do we do with jurisdictions? How do we get approval to image maybe internal machines if we suspect an insider and things like that? It's all kind of cool. All this stuff you can bring in leadership. So like, let's, let's have a, the brief going to leadership. Because then you have this, the, the incident commander briefing the, the leader and you go, hey, leader, was that any good? Well, I'd like it structured like this. 
cool, we'll restructure the briefing format. And then the, the leader gets the brief in the format they want. Ah, it's the easy stuff to like get. Then you can improve the leadership. You can then get, uh, you can then start bringing in more people. You can end up planning for a full enterprise environment. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. All right. Then you can end up with annual training, big exercises, lots of people. If you want, if you're worried, split the techie from the, ex from the leadership. Techie people do theirs, wait a couple of weeks, and then crunch all the numbers. And then the leadership can do their tabletop based upon the actual factual stuff from the techie people. Lovely. It's real data, but nobody's, your techies aren't under pressure from execs yet. And execs aren't under pressure trying to think, I've got to make decisions here in front of techies. I don't want to look stupid. So you can have a really engaging environment. Super awesome. So there we go. Quick thing, takeaway for you. Check your IR plan. Make sure you got one. Write an IM plan because some of you are thinking, I ain't got half the stuff I need. Okay. Plan for regular. And I say at least monthly, if you can do it bi-weekly or make it a Friday afternoon thing. It's a nice way to unwind. Okay. Break the plans because I don't want these to go, oh, our plans are amazing. They lie. Japanese watch. No, no, no. If you do an exercise and you have never done your, your plans before and they're all perfect, no, 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 no. You need to break them because breaking them with friends is better than breaking them in front of execs and looking bad. Fill in the gaps. Document it. Do it again. Wash, repeat. And then add the execs. Because they then, they get fun. They're like quite fun, you know? I remember one of the, when I've been running the, the exercises for quite a while and one of the teams, one of the IM teams came to us and went, you guys are all right, actually. At that point, we knew we now have integrated people. And that is, instead of having two separate teams, we now have one big team. And that's when you know when it's working. So in our plans, I said, you know, having a good team's awesome. You can do everything. But actually, you know, if you've got a really good, strong team that you've gone through lots of exercises and you've gone through lots of actually doing the things, it's not a case of you can write any plan. It's the fact that actually you don't need to because instead of having lots of fragmented people, you have one big team that actually has been through this mill before and can take on absolutely everything because ultimately it's not really plans. It's not just guidelines. If you like this, as I mentioned earlier, um, Leadership 553 is out, beat in October and then sort of bang out, uh, sort of on demand, probably about March time and uh, et cetera. Full, full five-day course, probably about February 2020, 2024. Yeah, 2024. Um, there's the link if you're interested. Um, it's all about this. It's kind of, it's about instant management. It's about all the different types of funny attack vectors, business email compromise, supply chain compromise. We have, we have fun labs. We've got YouTube videos to, uh, for you to assess meetings and things like this and engagement from, from various organizations. Really good fun, hands-on, different kind of way of learning kind of stuff. Um, if you have any questions, I've got a few minutes in the brief. Look at that. Oh, it's quite close. Actually, not too bad. I'll start a minute late. Got any questions? We can we can uh, bring them up. But if you ask the slides, I got to redact a few bits and pieces, make sure people don't like you know, reverse engineer stuff. So there's a few things. So, but they will be on the Sans webcast page, etc. And if you if you like this, share it with your friends. They can register and they can get the recording afterwards and slides afterwards in PDF format. And now I will try and bring up the chat and see what's going on. Do, 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 do. Any, any questions on there? Where are the questions go? Q and A. Okay. Oh, cool. Thank you, Lee. Awesome. Hopefully that's been enjoyed. Oh. I'm, I'm trying to work my way around the interface now. Da, 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 da. No. Brilliant. You answered everything so well, Steve, that nobody has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, I got to run for my next meeting. <laughs> if you do, there's the details there. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, et cetera. I'm happy to take lots of questions because people do like, how do you do this and how do you do that? Happy to help people. Um, it's all about making our teams stronger. So just reach out um, and always willing to share. Wonderful. Steve, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us. And we look forward to seeing all of you in Steve's class or at a future SANS event in the future. Thank you. Thank you.